now from the Kuiper Belt. <laughs> Janet. Oddly enough, I don't have anything about astronomy in this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oddly right. enough, but I love bringing up Kuiper Belt references whenever I can. Um, I have three poems for you guys, and yes, they are all post Roe v. Raid inspiration. Uh, this first one is titled Xing Out Lives. A male misogynist co worker and I'll make the money while she raises my kids in my house kind of guy, knew a woman from out of state in a really abusive relationship. And the thing, this button didn't press. In a really abusive relationship after she discovered she was pregnant from a boyfriend who terrified her, refusing to wear a condom, who would say she's stupid enough to get pregnant. She had to terminate the pregnancy before the boyfriend found out. So this male misogynistic co-worker asked if she could stay at her home for a few days while recovering. Of course she could, and of course we would. We welcomed her, give her whatever space she needed to physically and mentally recover. It broke our hearts when she felt bad that she bled. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Worry about you. And it broke my heart that me, the stranger, couldn't just wrap my arms around her and tell her everything would be okay. But the one thing we did notice about our male misogynist co-worker is that after he helped her, after he saw what being a male misogynist could do, how it could break a human being so, he began to understand the potential error of his ways. He was changed, and I am woe to say it only came after seeing the culmination of Xing Out Lives that changed him. Whose life was worth Xing Out, people ask. And this is the balancing act we all perform. For this one man, maybe the true fear of one woman, her fear of being X'd out by man, meant it was necessary for her to X out something before it became life. <sighs> Karma works in funny ways, where one woman is almost destroyed so a man could see salvation. You've heard the references before. A butterfly flaps its wings in Tibet and a rainforest burns in Brazil. Or after one woman is raped, she learns to make life better for all women. Maybe I saw it here in my no longer misogynistic man for him to see the light, as it were, and truly understand which lives are really worth saving. First one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second one, and I love it because you brought up the word queuing, and that's in the title of my po next poem, oh, Louise. Okay. Queuing as defeatist, but fighting for freedom. I thought it was so much of a riot that you said that. This is queuing as defeatist, but fighting for freedom. I don't know why I keep doing it. I, I don't know what I'm hoping to find. Wait, I, I do know what I'm looking for. I just didn't think it was so impossible to find. Since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, something that's been a part of my whole life, I've been checking, looking for changes, checking the news, hoping. So after searching the news, I see that France and Israel have chosen to strengthen their abortion rights for women after the U.S. is overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I know I love Brie Capri sandwiches sitting at a Paris cafe looking out onto the street at the passers-by, but I know how quickly they were conquered by Nazis in World War II. I've seen video footage of Hitler touring his then-conquered Paris. So after all these years, it's, it's good to see France bring so quick to support women's rights. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> but, but no, I'm no French girl, and no, I'm no Gal Gadot Israeli overcoming against all. Even though each and every one of us is a Wonder Woman, I, I still feel like the ever-repressed goth girl shunted from her soul, shunted from what's right. 
I, I know this goth girl may be uh, defeatist at heart, but when you've seen the evils of the world at an early age, we can only feign optimism for the minions. But when something so cruel is done, even us goth girls want to fight. I suppose our only choice becomes fighting any way we know how to make sure the world knows that these select southern United States shouldn't have the right to steal liberty and freedom. Most must now find a way to fight, somehow, anyhow, whichever way how, to regain our once and future rights. That's yeah. one. And then, and then one more, I said, because you said one at three. And this one, and it doesn't say queuing in it, but it was fun to say queuing, Q U E U E I N G. Uh, this last one's called Unless It's About Suppressing Life. Before the overturning of Roe v. Wade, a number of the United States in America set trigger laws that would instantly restrict a woman's right to an abortion. Trigger laws. That sounds a little Second Amendment-y, doesn't it? <laughs> or would that be Second Amendment-ish? <laughs> you get the point, the right to bear arms. This is woven into the U.S. Constitution, originally under the premise to protect ourselves from a government gone wrong, now revered for hunt, sport, protection. These trigger laws are about killing from the stroke of a pen instead of a weapon. Because, no, these trigger laws are not about stopping the killing of something yet to live. They're about killing the rights of women, plain and simple. Now, these trigger laws are proof that the Second Amendment is alive and well, no matter which side of the political aisle you claim allegiance. Americans want that Second Amendment so much that they will be ready to kill at the drop of a hat, then use trigger laws to remove rights from half of their people, too. Don't think these people care for embryos when they don't care for foster children, kids that are suffering, already alive. That's not the issue. It's not about life at all, unless it's about suppressing life, either from the stroke of a pen through a religious edict or the pulling of your precious trigger. That's it. <laughs> the policy. Your... A cartoon that said that the Second Amendment.